Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Initial DIY Mods. Today we're going to be taking apart our DSM 5-speed 4G63 all-wheel drive transmission. It's pretty similar for the Evo and for the front-wheel drive transmission, but there's a few little subtle differences. We're only going to go into the all-wheel drive variant today. This comes out of the all-wheel drive Mini Cooper swap that we've done. Check out those videos here in the card. Please share it with your friends as well. I'm sure that they love cars just as much as you, so they'll be interested in seeing this as well. Now let's get to this transmission. First thing we did was we took our bearing races and we double bagged them and threw them in a bag of water, ice, and salt to really try and shrink down the bearings a little bit. This helped to bring our intermediate lower especially to be able to put in the hole. It's still pretty hard to, to kind of mallet in, but at least we're not damaging it this way. We used the old race to help tap it in as well. Some of the other ones we didn't have to freeze, but it really did help to, to get a little bit of extra clearance there, an extra thou or so. Now there is no race for the front differential. These are not tapered roller bearings. They are just standard ball bearings. So the clearance is a little bit wider and you do have uh, no actual bearing races to install. So now we're doing our solder on these and we're using our three millimeter solder here first to go underneath the output shaft. So this hole right here. And so using this wider solder helps fill up some of the gap a little bit better for these ones specifically. We will use the thicker solder on the all-wheel drive output pinion shaft as well as on the center differential. All the other ones will get the 0.062 inch uh, rather than the 332nd for the 3 mil um, larger stuff. So we just go ahead and push them in. Now we can go ahead and try and balance these sections of solder onto the, uh, onto the bearings tediously like we're doing right here and we will spin them just ever so perfectly in the right place. And as soon as you bump it, the whole thing falls over. So again, this is possible. I did this the first time I did this, but what I ended up doing later on was playing a little bit more of a game like Operation, where I used some needle nose pliers and I went ahead and just tucked them in using a flat head to help push them on. This was a lot easier to do, took way less time, way less effort, if your seals aren't in place. So if your seals are already installed and you don't wanna pop them out, you can do it the other way too. Now we're gonna take our bell housing bolts. We're gonna go ahead and tighten this down and torque it to spec. This helps to crush the solder in place so that we go ahead and get the perfect measurement of what the end play is. But you need to make sure that where you place your solder on the bearing race is avoiding the letters that are on the race, the brand names, because that will throw off your measurements in the end. So now we need to drop in our gear sets. We don't need to worry about shift forks or anything like that right now. Uh, we can drop in our center differential and now we need to put in our uh, races on the other side. Now these ones are much easier to tap in, which is really helpful considering we need to take them in and out a few times to do our shimming. We're gonna do the shimming completely three different times. Uh, we wanna make sure that all of our measurements line up accurately. If we're not getting them accurate, we do it again. So we're using our .062 here. We got the resin core ones. These ones tend to be a little bit easier to squish to fill up that gap. Again, we're trying to use this as like a clay to really measure the end thickness that is in between the extra space that's between the back of the race and the case when everything's assembled. So now we're putting on our end case over. We already have our, um, we already have our solder in place and we're gonna to torque everything down to spec. We're gonna go ahead and let this sit for a couple hours. 15 minutes is usually okay if it's a warm area. Maybe you can go a little bit longer uh, overnight if you're lazy like me. And then you gotta take it all back apart and we need to use a micrometer to measure the solder. So these are not as good as a vernier micrometer, which is like a mechanical micrometer that machinists use, but they are usually a lot cheaper. You can get one usually like 25 bucks or something like that at Harbor Freight. They're pretty easy to, to use as well as they give you a nice digital readout. So we're gonna go ahead and put this in place. If there's any letters that transfer from the bearing, you wanna make sure to avoid those so that you get a nice clean flat reading, which I'll repeat a few times, usually three, to make sure I don't have any sort of taper going across each piece of solder. So in this case, we got 0.0564 as our micrometer reading. I like to take photos of these uh, in the location that I pulled them from in the background so I know later on exactly where I got these measurements from. It's kind of an easy way to make sure you don't forget. You need to do this to both sides of each bearing and you need to do it at least three times total or until your measurements are consistent. For me, that took like seven or eight tries to really get this compression right. 
So for example, if our crush solder is 0.0564 like it was in the previous uh, sample, then our preload spec would be, let's say, 4 to 7,000, so 0.004 to 0.007. So then you add those two together and you get your shim measurement of between 0.0604 and 0.0634 for that location. You then go to the spec sheet and pull all of those measurements that you need for those different shims. You get those part numbers and then you use those part numbers to order your different shims for each specific location. Each pair of bearings needs one shim. This is what the shim looks like and it goes in place. Now in this case, we replaced this one bearing in our last video with the new bearing, but we measured the shim for the old bearing so that no longer will work. In order to make our own shims, we went ahead and bought this stainless shim in a can, which is 0.3 millimeters thick. We're then able to cut out a piece of metal and use it as our shim. In some cases, you can buy the shims directly. Uh, I bought several shims. Uh, they took about a month to arrive from Japan. And that was when I found out that two of the shims were actually canceled. And then I said, screw it, it's DIY, let's make it ourselves. So we're cutting these out with some tin snips and we're trying a few different ways. We're trying to punch out the center section. We're trying to drill out the center section and we're trying to use tin snips to cut out the center section. None of these really worked very well. So we ended up switching over to the Dremel with a flex shaft and kind of little by little cutting out that intersection there until we can get enough daylight to be comfortable and then switching it around and doing the same thing. Now we can stack shims. So for one of our shims, we need to take the old one, shave it down and stack it with a new 30,000 shim. On the other hand, there's a second bearing that needs a full replacement uh, shim that's gonna be a 30 thousandths measurement. So it's pretty much perfect in both these cases. So we got our front, uh, front diff in, we can pop in the new bearings and our output shaft in. And we went ahead and swapped out our, our magnet here, this little trash magnet. Uh, you can buy a three quarters inch neodymium magnet on eBay. I think it was like, I got 10 magnets for three bucks or something like that. I cleaned out this old piece, threw in this new way, way, way stronger magnet, this rare earth magnet, and it's just significantly better. Just spend the three bucks, get these things when you're doing it. We use a little bit of oil on our shafts so they're not totally dry uh, when we install these bearings. This is how everything's gonna go into place. I find it's a little bit easier to put these, uh, the intermediate shaft and the input shaft in while we get the reverse set up first, then I pull them back out. So I'm putting a little bit of red Loctite on this tapered screw that we're throwing in here. I went ahead and replaced it with a new one because the old one basically stripped out removing it. And here's how you're gonna install your, your reverse lever. Make sure you don't forget that. And you're gonna install this little piece here that helps to guide the, the gears in place. So I went ahead and aligned my uh, shift forks with the gears outside of the transmission and then dropped them in as one assembly and then wiggling and, and uh, fiddling everything kind of in place. This was just a lot less stressful and a lot less of a annoying jigsaw puzzle with uh, bad tolerances. Once those were in place, we reinstalled our reverse idler and our uh, reverse shift mechanism as well. Make sure you test everything out here because if something doesn't shift right here, you know, you will have a little bit of play that you weren't intending for, but overall, if it doesn't go into gear or something's binding, it's wrong, figure it out, do it again before you put it all together. We're gonna throw in a little coat, a light, thin coat of RTV. I said thin, y'all, just to make sure that it seals up those imperfections. Everything else will bolt together and we'll torque it to spec. We're gonna go ahead and throw in our reverse bolt as well. This is what aligns the, um, the reverse idler gear shaft. And we'll double check our shims, make sure we're taking the right ones uh, and we're not trying to put them in the wrong case. So we got our .046 shim and we're gonna throw that here underneath. This one came straight from Japan, so it's perfect. Our next shim, we'll double check, just make sure that the packaging lines up, 0.048. And with our phone, that matches 0.048, what we needed. Now for this next one, we went ahead and cut out another uh, piece of metal, another shim in a can, to create our own shim. So we're just taking off the edges here, just to make sure it's a little bit duller. And instead of trying to Dremel out the inside, I said, you know what, it's all gonna get pressed together. It doesn't matter if there's a cut across it. So I went ahead and just trimmed it out. Okay. 
and throw our old shim onto the belt sander. And what we're doing here is we're trying to evenly apply pressure to the entire shim and little by little we're going to keep checking as we go and shave down this shim to the spec that we need so that this old shim shaved down plus the new shim we just cut out equals the exact size that we need. So now we have our .0563 which was canceled when it came from Japan. So we took our old shim, shaved it down, added our new shim and got our .0566 spec that we needed. So we can throw these, the one we made and the one that we uh, had before, the stock one, and we'll throw them together. And this is, you know, pretty close. We get .0585, so we're two thou thicker. But again, we're, we're using um, just some calipers here and not an actual uh, micrometer. Now we're going to go ahead and coat everything in oil, especially your bearings and gears. Uh, these are going to be basically, you don't want to install them dry, you want to lubricate them as you do it. I wait till now because it makes a little bit less of a mess and they're a little bit easier to handle. Again, another coat here of our gray RTV, ultra gray, the rigid stuff, another layer of oil. We're going to go ahead and throw this bearing onto our output shaft and we're going to just throw it up inside here going through the center diff. We're going to make sure to put our little ball in there, our retaining ball, and then as we drop this viscous coupler on top, that's going to sandwich that ball in place and hold the shaft in place. So we don't put too much pressure, we'll put a block of wood in there, then we can get in our snap ring, measure up our clearance and make sure it's not too good. Feels a little loose, uh, but overall it should be okay, it's just trying to retain a bit there. We'll throw in our fifth gear uh, on the intermediate side, and we'll put in our bearing on the input side. Throw in our fifth gear, throw in our synchro, throw in our shift fork, align the shift fork to drop that in place. Give it a little tap, tap, tap a -roo. And now we can throw in our pin. Now we can throw on our next nut and torque it down to 109 foot pounds. We're going to bring back our two pennies from the first episode and we're going to torque these down to spec. These do get awkward. Sometimes you got to get kind of crafty in how you can hold that thing in place and get your torque. Then you're going to throw in some more RTV on this last layer here. Don't forget, if you've already done your RTV, to go ahead and punch in your, um, your transmission nuts and make sure you get your outer synchro in place for fifth gear. Another little heavy helping of oil on these gears, and then you can throw in your end case. You're going to throw in your, your bolts just as you normally would, torque those down. I think it's 35 foot-pounds, but always check your manual to confirm. Wipe off any excess just so it looks a little bit prettier. It matches that gray paint so perfectly. Now we're going to throw in, uh, put our washer onto our reverse uh, switch for the uh, reverse light. And now we're going to put in our vents here. We're just putting a little bead of RTV around it just to help keep them in place and try and keep everything sealed up. Worst case, if I have to install these again, I'll rip the old ones out and throw them away, buy new ones, put more RTV on it. They're not that expensive. Now we'll go ahead and change our pivot ball. Now since you did all these new gears and everything, um, when you put in your new clutch and your new shift fork and everything else you've replaced, you want to make sure that you are shimmed properly. I had to pull my transmission after I put everything back together. See that old grot bearing? It's gross. Throw a new one on. Get the OEM ones. I hear they are a little bit better. Um, I can't vouch for that. As your clutch wears or as you get an aftermarket clutch, you will end up with a different spacing. And if you don't check that stuff before you install your transmission fully, uh, you're going to end up with some, uh, some painst a painstaking process of taking it all back apart. So now you can go ahead and just hulk this thing down and get it aligned. Now once you get all this stuff bolted together, if your engine starts trembling in fear, kind of like this, then you know you did a good job and it's ready for some serious horsepower. Enjoy, I hope you guys like this build. Please check out the Patreon page. Please get on social media, like, follow us, share and subscribe and uh, for more content. So thanks again everybody. I hope this video was helpful. Please let me know any questions, comments you have below and we'll respond as quick as we can. So with that, thank you guys for watching and check us out on the next episode of Initial DIY Mods. What is this, a phone call?
Am I leaving a voicemail? Son of a bitch. <laughs>